Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olaf. I'm an alcoholic, member of the Had Enough Yet Big Book Discussion Group here in Toronto. Hi. Wow, it's great to be here to share my story with you. When I tell you my name, my home group, and so on, what I'm doing is I'm telling you who I am. I never liked my name, neither would you growing up in the <laughs> six, 70s and the 80s. Um, I like my name now. I really do. Um, telling you what I am, I'm an alcoholic. And where I belong, I have a home group. I go to my home group. I have a job there. They love me and I love them. The, um, I was born and raised in Toronto. Go ahead. Thanks so much. I was born and raised in Toronto and I have a, a younger brother, two very strict German parents. And there was three rules in my house, just three. Don't talk back, do it right or not at all. And I can't remember the third one. I had trouble following those rules. Do as you're told, there it is. And um, that's the one I had the most problems with. <laughs> I li selective listening <clears throat> and um, got into a lot of trouble at home for whatever reason. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention very often. Um, always felt different. Never felt right. Never felt like I belonged. I didn't like school very much. I never had very many friends. Friends were not allowed in the house. Um, mom would, would raise hell. Um, yelling and screaming all the time. Dad would lay on the couch, watch TV, get up, go to work, come back, go right back on that couch. Uh, it's bizarre. When, she, when I was 15, my parents separated, divorced. She married a guy who did the same, go to work, come home, sit on the couch and watch TV. <laughs> and right now, as we speak, they're watching TV. <laughs> um, So dropped out of school halfway through, through uh, grade 10, failed grade 7. We moved an awful lot. We may as well have just stayed packed. Uh, didn't like packing or unpacking much. The, um, like I said, they split up when I was 15. And thank goodness the house was finally quiet. Um, there was no drinking going on at my house. Just a lot of yelling and screaming. And um, everything had to be done right. Do it again if it's not done right. I remember homework papers used to have to have, the, uh, my printing had to be just perfect. There could not be a spelling mistake. If there was, redo it. And I, oh, I, I just hated to bring homework home. The, um, but you know, she, coming from Germany, she taught me how to read, write, and do mathematics for someone coming here from another country. I think that's pretty impressive. Um, so I, I learned that stuff. So after the, the house was finally quiet, I could finally co go, come and go as I like. I was 13 when I got drunk for the first time. I was out with the in crowd, the crowd that the older kids, the, the kids that used to hang out the back of the portables in the schoolyard. And I got to smoke cigarettes. And they, they invited me over to the house and uh, they, they gave me alcohol. They gave me gin. And oh, did it ever taste horrible. My God, it was the worst taste of my life. What on earth are you guys drinking this stuff for? They just, never mind, just drink away. I didn't say that. I'm thinking it. And I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted real bad to belong. And now that I'm here, just shut up and drink it. I drank three of those and somebody asked for, for, for a bottle of pop or something from the fridge. And I very so kindly got up and said, I'll get it. And holy crap, I couldn't believe the way I felt. Taller, smarter, stronger, better looking. Wow. This is fantastic. And I don't even care what people think anymore. My God. Anyway, so 
that was fine. That was, that was okay. So I sat back down later on and, and drank some more of those. And we decided to take a long walk over to the mall. That's where I got sick, picked up by the police, brought to the host- police station, brought to the hospital. And two weeks later, I ended up in court. The judge said to me, if I catch you in this courtroom again under these conditions or any other young man, you're going to go to a boy's home. I was only almost 13. And um, I thought to myself, I never want to drink that stuff again as long as I ever live. That was the worst tasting stuff. I've never been so sick in my entire life. But I did feel pretty good for a short time. I'll manage better next time, but not today or anytime soon. And so then uh, my dad came and picked me up from the the hospital and and mom wasn't too happy about it. I got a beating for that. Got lots of beatings. And so um, long anyway, so that all finally ended after they separated. And I didn't start drinking again for another couple of years. But I did get involved with with the smoking pot and um that's all i'm going to tell you about that because this is aa um the two of them went hand in hand but that's it that's my drinking stories i slept a lot i slept way more than i sat up and drank because it never took me very much three or four and i was sleeping no matter where no matter how loud it was, rock concerts, in the clubs, in the car, at a red light, I would, I got, the police were pounding on my door. Hey, the light's green. Because <gasps> I pass out, I would just pass out. Everywhere and anywhere, snow banks, bus shelters, um, everywhere. And so um, that's, that's how I drank. I got married, um, didn't mean to. It just happened. Went to visit my mom in in New Orleans. That's where she was living at the time. And uh, she suggested that I bring my new girlfriend, who I really liked, to come down to visit her. Because I was making a big deal of this new girlfriend. And she said, why don't you just bring her down so we can meet her? She's such a big deal. I said, okay. Off we went. That's when she learned how to drive. She didn't have her driver's license. And nor did we have money for a hotel, so we couldn't stop the car. And so we might as well just keep driving. And that's what happened. And we got there. And two or three days later, she said, you know what? You're right. She is a nice girl. Have you ever thought of getting married? No. 21. Are you kidding me? She says, it will be just perfect. If you get married, it'll be perfect. I'll buy the rings, she says. I'll buy you guys the ring. Um, you can wear something of Harold, her husband, and, and Rose can wear something of mine, and we'll find somewhere to get you guys married, and everything will be perfect. First time in my life, I heard her say, I approve if you do this. Couldn't get her approval for any, never, 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 never. But this time, I figured, why not? I said, sure. Okay. That's all it took. And uh, we drove home four days later with just married written on the back of the car with that winter snow paint. You know, when you put snow on the windows to make it for Christmas decorations. Yeah. Just married. And <laughs> wow. And we're driving home back to Toronto. And thinking to myself, this is it? Really? Um, Okay. I came home with a ring. And um, I told my brother and my dad. And they looked at me and says, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm married. Isn't it great? And they said, why did you do that? (laughs) What got into your thinking? The international answer I gave to everything when I didn't want to look stupid. I don't know. Seemed like a good idea at the time. I didn't know that I was seeking approval. And uh, I I spent a lot of time, effort, 
energy and money on seeking approval. I could tell you lots of stories about that. And uh, it got me nowhere, absolutely nowhere. When I hit bottom in AA, and I learned about that after having done my fourth and my fifth step, I finally cut the, the strings. I was a puppet. I was everybody's puppet. I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. I was a pup, the marionette, you know, I cut the strings. I'm nobody's puppet anymore. I don't serve people. I serve God today. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't seek approval anymore. I, I, I love to serve, but I don't seek seek approval today anymore. I know the difference. Um, so, right, marriage, children, two kids, that went, I had the best job in my life. I'm a billboard painter, painting murals, big advertising billboards. Best job in my life. And uh, had that job for about a year. And I was married for just about a year and a little bit. And then I got this brand new job. And then I met her. Her. Wow. I got caught. My wife gave me an ultimatum. I I got caught again, and that was the end of that marriage, and my drinking just went skyrocket for the next five years, five and a half years, actually. Um, all I did was drink, drink, drink. That's all I could do, and that's all I wanted to do because I just couldn't stand the truth. I couldn't stand feeling the way I felt. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I could not face what I did. And, um, you know, visiting the kids, it was just so guilt ridden, just horrible. I couldn't do it. Although I did, I, I had the kids on every other weekend. Um, it was just horrible. Finally, my girlfriend and I were up North. We, uh, we got into a great big argument at this point. There was nobody left in my life. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. And, uh, her and I got into this huge fight. We're driving. She got out of the car, slammed the door, and told me something that I can't say here. She told me that she never wants to see me again, that she was through, and this time I believed her. She said that to me many, many times in the past, but this time I actually believed her. And um, she got out of the car and started walking this way down this very long dirt road that takes 20 minutes to drive. And I drove the car the opposite way. And I had this moment of clarity and I thought to myself, what am I doing? I can't leave her there like that. I turned the car around to go get her and she was gone. Disappeared into thin air. It's impossible. There's tall grass on each side, fields, acres and acres of field on both sides. And the road is real long impossible and i drove and drove and drove and drove back to the main road and she wasn't there anywhere she was gone and, and and right before my very eyes was my life i thought i can't live i can't live without her i can't even get drunk and stay drunk anymore i got no friends no family no money no job i am useless i am worthless i am not worth anything i need to kill myself and get it over with so i don't have to live another moment in my head so i'm i drove and drove and drove and drove towards home looking for a truck to smash into and that didn't happen i got home i fell asleep i woke up with that feeling of guilt remorse and shame and oh my god i just i hate pain otherwise i would have hurt myself with i i, I just hated myself so badly all I could do is get back in the car and start driving back up north. To, now I'm sober. Drive back up north to find her and explain and talk to her. Apologize one more time and see if she could change her mind one more time. Promise I won't drink one more time. And on my way to, back up there, before I got onto the highway, Bill's car was in the driveway. Bill was a guy I used to work with. We were sign painters together and he would, he was a trip. He would come up to me on Monday mornings and pat me on the back and say, good morning, Olaf, how was your weekend? 
and I turn at to turn over to him and swear at him and tell me, tell him, leave me alone. The hell do you want to know for? Leave me alone. What's good about it? Shut up. And I would walk away. And he'd say, oh, it's not so bad. It can't be so bad. Come on. How was your weekend? And he would tease me, right? And I'd swear at him. And he'd say, hey, hey. And then I'd turn around and he'd say, what causes a problem is a problem. I said, yeah, that'd be you. Now shut up and leave me alone. He says, hey, hola. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And that just... Whoosh, went right over my head. And the two of them, oh, my girlfriend, she worked with us too. The one that she did come back. She, uh, she came back and, uh, oh, hold on. I'm, I'm ahead of myself. I'm sorry. So his car was in the driveway. I pulled my car into the driveway. I pounded on his door, bawling my eyes out. And uh, see, this guy had something about him that I didn't know what it was because he never really told me. Others than he used to drink like crazy beat up his girlfriend, uh, uh, he, couldn't get, he couldn't keep a job, he was angry, miserable, and, and just full of hate. But when I knew him, he wasn't like that. He was happy, he was sober, and he didn't drink anymore. That's all I knew about him. That's all I knew about him. And he was sober for a year. So his car was in the driveway. I knocked on his door. I said, Bill, I need your help. And I explained to him what I just told you. And he says, oh, really? You want my help? What are you doing here? I said, I need your help. I need your help. And I explained to him, he says, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do to get sober and to get happy? He said, anything, anything. Come here. I got to show you something. I showed him. I brought him over to my car. I took out a half a case of beer and I broke them, broke all the bottles in the garbage can. And I took whatever pot that I had in my pocket and I dumped it. I said, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Today, I wanted to die. I can't predict what I'm going to do. When I drink, I can't guarantee what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do, where I'm going to be. I can't predict my behavior once I stop, once I start drinking. He says, oh, okay. I said, Bill, all I know about you is you don't, all I know about you is that you don't drink. Please talk to me. I need your help. So he invited me in and he proceeded to tell me about AA and he told me about the disease that when I take a drink into my body, it goes into my body, sets off some, something strange, some craving thing, tells my mind I need to have more. And once I start, it, it, I can't stop. It's like getting on that merry or it's like getting on that ride, the zipper. And it just takes you around and around and around and around and around and around. And you can't stop and you can't get off once you're on it. And I thought to myself, yeah, that, I guess that makes sense. Because once I start, I can't stop. And I like it. But now I'm afraid of it. And I never want to die. I never want to drink again. He says, okay, well, tonight we're going to, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, would I like to? Damn, I have to, I need help. So off we went to a speaker meeting. Some guy from Scotland told a similar story everywhere he went. He brought himself with him. Everywhere he went, he ended up drinking. Okay, I get it. I had the same problem. The second night, we went to a, a men's meeting. A whole bunch of guys. I was 29 years old. These guys were old. 50. Some of them were even 60, but they were sober a long time. Wow. And they were happy. <laughs> oh, wow. They were happy to see me. They didn't even know who I was. Some of them couldn't say my name, right? That made me cross. Where'd that word come from? Cross. That pissed, uh, anyway, I won't say. Um, but they were happy to see me. They wanted me to come back. They gave me a book, great big fat book. Like who's going to read that little tiny black words, no pictures. Really? But they gave it to me and they put their phone numbers and their names in it. They passed this book around and it came back to me and they said, that's yours. <laughs> wow. Wow. We hope you come back. We meet three times a week. Wow. Awesome. Okay. And they're shaking my hand. It's like, shake my hand what are you shaking my hand for and so 
they were glad to see me. They want me to come back. Bill and I left that meeting and I turned to look over at the doorway and over the door, there was a sign that said Yana Place. I said, Bill, who's Yana? What kind of a place is this? He says, oh, Yana stands for you are not alone. And it hit me. It was just like, oof, wow, wow, yeah, I finally belong somewhere. They want me to come back. I don't have to pay any money. I don't have to do anything to fit in here. They were telling some serious stories about themselves in there. My God, they were telling on themselves, like they were telling about stuff you never talk about ever, but they were. And so, uh, wow, I was, I was very intrigued. I said, Bill, how am I going to get happy like them? There's some real happy guys in there. There's a few unhappy guys in there, but how am I going to get like those guys? What do I got to do to be like you and like them? He said, take the word how, H-O-W, three-legged stool. Honest, get as honest as you can and don't lie. And I'm thinking, geez, I can do that. <laughs> I don't have a good memory anyways. <laughs> Open up your mind. Listen to what we tell you and become willing to do the things that we do here. I said, well, what do we do? He says, we go to meetings every single day. We go to closed study meetings where we read from the book and we share. I said, okay, and then what? He said, we get a sponsor and we start working the steps and we ask God for help in the morning and we thank him throughout the day. And then at night we say, thank you for another sober day. I said, well, that's it. He says, yep. That's all I'm telling you for now. I said, fine, I can remember that and I can do it because I never want to drink again, ever, 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 ever. He says, I just want you to observe one thing very clearly and don't you ever forget this. There are only, only two teachers. There's only two. There's those who teach you what to do and those who teach you what not to do. And all you got to do is open up your eyes and listen and pay close attention. Go to the same meeting every week so that you get to know them and that they get to know you. We want to watch you grow and then you get to watch them. I said, okay, I can do that. You're going to come with me? He said, yeah. He I, and, and I asked him to be my sponsor. And okay, we're good. We are good. So we're keep coming back. So glad to see you. Right? 30-day chip, two-month chip. Oh man, I collecting them, right? Go, I got a job. I got my old job back. Bill and I are working together again, painting signs. So now I got him all day. Go home, eat dinner, come out again and go to meetings with him. I was, geez, the only thing we weren't doing was living together. But we were together a lot for the first year and a half. The, uh, this key coming back, pat on the back. Glad to see you. So happy that you're still around. That only lasted for a short time. Three months. I hate you. I hate him. She, who came back, she came back. Her 12-year-old daughter moved in. Something happens with 12-year-old daughters. <laughs> they change. She moved in and she didn't like me. And I didn't really like her. And she made life real complicated. And so I was complaining a whole lot. I got my three-month chip. I hate the world, especially her and my sponsor, who's really getting on my nerves. And I hate sobriety. Sobriety sucks. Sobriety sucks. And we're driving back to the meeting. It's a 40-hour drive. Sorry, 40-minute drive. Three times a week, 40 minutes. 40 minutes back. And he says, Olaf, I'm done. I am done listening to you. I need you to tell the group. I said, okay, I'll tell the group. So what happens at that group is you go around the room. Tell us how was you, tell us your name and how was your week? Really? No, really. How was your week? Really? Here's an honesty thing, right? These guys were so honest. It was crazy. And so I told them and they laughed and they're laughing and they're laughing. And my grand sponsor, who sponsored half of the group, Irishman, sober forever, used to just sit there like this with his arms crossed and this big furrow in between his eyes. He'd say, hey, and the room went quiet. What step are you on? 
And holy crap, I'm thinking to myself, oh, and the steps are written on the wall. He says, look at the wall. What step are you on? Well, I don't want to get this answer wrong. Look stupid. I'm on step one. He said, how long are you sober? Three months. You're not on step one. You've taken that step already. Do you really need to go back drinking to find out if you're powerless over alcohol that your life's a mess? We know your life's a mess. We just heard about it. Step one, section B, you're in management, pal. Get over it. The first, Olaf, the first step brought you here. Or you wouldn't be here. It's Thursday night. It's payday. I said, yeah, I guess you're right. He said, look at the wall. Look at the second step. I said, I don't understand. He said, that's okay. Because you've already taken step two. I said, what? He says, yeah, you've taken step two. You keep coming back here three times a week. You've been coming here for three months. You got a sponsor both of which are a power greater than yourself. Do you believe that? I said, well, now that you put it that way, yeah, sure. He says, check that one off. Open up the book, page 60. Everybody's got their book, <laughs> page 60. And we start reading 60 to 63, talking about the actor, the guy who wants his own way. That's me. This, this Alcoholics Anonymous could also be called, I want my own way anonymous. And if I don't get it, I'll drink myself to death. <laughs> I just want my own way all the time. And then I'll be happy. I had this when and then thinking when I get my own way, then I'll be happy. And I don't care what it takes to get it. And if I don't get my own way, I'll pout and then feel sorry for myself and let you know about it. That's me. That's me. Sober, crazy, nuts. And that 12-year-old was not behaving the way I thought she should. Or anyway, so he said, it sounds like you're going back out for a drink. It sounds like you're on your way. If life continues going the way it is right now, Olaf, we probably won't see you here on Monday. And he may as well have just hit me in the head with a bat. That's what it felt like when he said that to me. Kind of like squashed me like an ant. He said, tell you what, you go home and do a fourth and a fifth step. Come back next week and let us know how that turned out for you. And if not, see you around, pal. And the meeting continued as if, it did, as if none of that ever happened. <sighs> so here's what's going on in my head. I'll tell, I'll show you. I'll show you. I am not coming back to this meeting next week and tell you they ain't done. Like hell, the only one that says it can't be done is me. I ain't going to have you tell me. SOB, I'll show you. So at the end of the meeting, I said, Bill, you're showing me how to do four steps. As soon as, let's go. We're going home and I need you to sit down and show me how to do this thing. I'm not going back to that meeting and tell them it ain't done. Look like a dummy. No way, no chance, no how. Remember, I was raised in a home where you do it right or not at all, but it's getting done. Hello, that's kicked into full speed. We're on this. Got it done. Got it done. Learned an awful lot about myself. Whole bunch of embarrassing stuff about myself, but I didn't care. Now I got to admit it to Bill. I really don't care what happens after this. If he tells on me, tells my girlfriend, I really don't care. I am not going back Monday and telling him it ain't done. It was Thursday night. I had all weekend. I had it done. Sunday, I did my fifth step over and out. I admitted it to God on my knees in prayer. I admitted to myself in the mirror. And then I admitted it all to God or to, to Bill. And I was elated. This, I bounced home. I, I, I swear, I floated home after that experience. I couldn't believe the way I felt. Better than any drunk, better than any drug, better than getting my own way, better than anything I've ever, ever felt in my life. 
Like the book says, I could look the world in the eye. I could never look at you in the eye. I would talk to the floor all the time. My mother used to go crazy. Look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> right? Any, anybody else? <laughs> well, hey, that's what happened to me. I can look you in the eye. I was so easily intimidated before. So easily. Tall people scared me to death. I was terrified of tall people. I'm 5'8". Anybody taller than me, I was terrified because I got beat up when I was 15 from a tall kid. And people that are taller than me can't help it. Their bones are longer than mine. They were born that way. What am I afraid of it for? I was bullied by a kid. Get over it. I forgave him. In my fourth step, he asked me, forgive them all. Don't go forward until you do. I need you to go and forgive them all. It says we ask God to show us the same tolerance, pity, and patience, that their hair doesn't fall out, that their kids go to school on scholarship. They never run out of money. They have an incredible health. Everything about them is incredible. Everything I want for me to happen to them. And I had to go through that list and I forgave them all. I walked away with that. I forgave me. I forgave me. I was drinking when I behaved like that. Cut myself some slack. Give myself a pass. I was insane. I was nuts when I wrote that, you know, when I was behaving that way. Not doing it now. Not doing it now. I was able to make my amends. All of them. Every single one of them. He said, I want to see your list before you start making amends. So what do you want to see my list for? He says, I'm going to, we're going to go through your list. I want to know how you harm them. Convince me. How did you harm them? Talking bad about somebody isn't harming them. It's harming me. Now, if they got fired, if something really drastic happened, that's a problem. Admit that. Go and make amends for that. But otherwise, leave it alone. The name came off the list. So I ended up with one third of my list was removed because I couldn't convince my sponsor on how I harmed them. Then, first five easy ones. Come on, let's see them. Tell me, who are they? By the end of today, those need to be done. He said, Olaf, this is where I'm going to lose you. Either here, either in the fourth step, which I haven't, or in the ninth step. And I, sw I swear, I said, I am not going any place. I'm doing these amends. That's it. I don't care. You know what? It's easy. I've already forgiven myself and them for what they did. It's easy for me to come to you and make amends to you. Here it is. You ready? I was wrong. What I did to you was wrong. Will you forgive me? How can I make it up to you? Just let me know. Is there anything that I'm unaware of that I don't know that you want to tell me? And then zip it and let them talk. This too shall pass, this too shall pass, this too shall pass, right? And then their name came off the list. Check. Then he'd say to me, okay, well done. Next five. Every day was five more, five more, five more. And that's how I got through it. I'm free. Somewhere in our book, it says, God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. Well, you got to get free first. Got to get free first. I spend lots of time, money, energy, and effort on getting free and happy. I spent everything on getting happy. Every penny I ever made, unless of course I had to give it away to, for rent and food, it I had to make me happy. Every other penny I spent on making me happy, temporary. I think that's why they give you three months at work. You start a brand new job, they give you three months, let's see how you behave. They should give you four months. It should really be four because after three, I'm done behaving myself. <laughs> I just want relief. Remember, my sponsor said, Ola, my job is to get you from relief, which is down here, to recovery, which is way up here. You willing to settle for relief or do you want recovery? I said, I want recovery. He says, good. That's where we're going with this. And then you're going to go out there and serve. You're going to go out there and help other people. What a trip. Wow. It has been such a cool trip. So I was working at this one place one time, and this great big guy who used to 
Um, he was intimidating. And he had a four by eight sheet of plywood on his back one day. And he walked up to me and he says, what are you doing? I'm stirring a can of paint. What's it look like? He said, don't get smart with me. I said, you asked me what I'm doing. I told you what I'm doing. What are you looking for, a fight? And he went to go to put the piece of wood down. I said, you know what? Why don't you just leave me alone and continue doing what you're doing? I had the courage to face up to him. That's, that's not something common. It's not something I was able to do before. Not a chance. I was given visiting rights to my kids. And here was the deal. The judge said, you can see them on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You pick them up five o'clock Friday, drop them off five o'clock Sunday. You have to call 24 hours ahead before you go pick them up, 24 hours ahead before you drop them off. So I'd have to call on Thursday at five o'clock and say, hey, Rose, I'm coming to pick. It's OK for me to come and get the kids tomorrow at five o'clock. She said, yep. I said, OK, thanks. Bye. Saturday night, five o'clock. This was before cell phones and alarms. <laughs> and um, I love my alarm. I got lots of them. So, and, and then on Saturday, I'd call at five o'clock and say, okay, Sunday, come and pick, drop them off. She said, no problem. And I did that. I did that. I did that for three and a half years. And then finally she said, you don't have to call. I believe you. I believe you. It's, it's about repetition, doing what you say, following through with a commitment. I couldn't commit to anything. I couldn't commit to a time. I couldn't commit to a thing before. Time meant nothing to me. Nothing. I remember going there to visit, to go get the kids. And she'd bring up the past. Do you remember the time when you, every single time I went, she always had one lined up. And if I stood there long enough, she'd have another one constantly rubbing my nose in the past constantly and i would just stand there and just mm -hmm, mm -hmm, hit me again go ahead and so one day so that was sunday night monday night went back to the meeting and i told the group if you ever want to know anything just tell the group and they'll give you lots of feedback at least mine did See, we call it feedback, but uh, my sponsor calling, darn, darn, darn. Um, most people call it crosstalk, but our group calls it saving your butt. See, I come to the meeting with no options. I come to the meeting broken, all out of ideas. I have no direction. I don't know what to do. I share my situation with my group and they give me feedback. Now, I leave the meeting with information. I leave the meeting with more information than when I got there. Then you had a good meeting. I've gone to meetings where people come with their, with, drop a, a bomb on the table. We're not going to spend much time with them. Give them a quick feedback and then carry on with the meeting. And then I've gone to meetings where, oh, that's crosstalk. You can't talk like that in the meeting. And the guy goes home and drinks. Guy's about to, <laughs> no, no, you come here. You get him at the end of the meeting. A little tougher to do on Zoom, but not in person. That's one of the things I miss about the in-person meetings. Um, so I couldn't wait till Friday of two weeks from now. I'm going to call her tonight when I get home. And she brought up the past again. She said, what are you doing calling me? I said, well, I just called to say hi to see how was the kids. She says, do you remember the time, the last time you, I, and I let her finish. And she, and I said, thank you. This is what my friend, one of the guys at the meeting said. I went to the meeting. I'm sorry. I got sidetracked with that phone call. My, um, 
I told the group, I said, guys, every time I go there, she brings up the past. And, and one of the old timers said, how long are you sober? I said, four and a half years. He said, really? Four and a half years? I said, yeah. He said, have you been doing the things that she's been reminding you of? I said, no, sir. I have not acted like, like that to her or anyone else since I've been drinking. He said, well, then good. The next time she reminds you of anything at all, if it's, if it's true, thank her for reminding you of the guy you used to be. I said, what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank her. Because you need to have these reminders. Well, like I said, I called her up when I got home and, she, and I thanked her and she shut down. <laughs> the following, the next time I saw her in person, she did it again. I thanked her. She hasn't done it since. I mean, the odd slip here and there and right away. Thanks. Yeah, I forgot about that. She knows my whole past for the whole time we were together. And it wasn't plenty. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pleasant. Uh, we had great, some great times, but when I was drunk out of my mind, I didn't treat her nice at all. Um, this thing. So these two kids grew up. Uh, my son has got out today. He got out today. Six year sentence. Six years in jail for drugs and alcohol. They grew up in, the, in AA meetings. They came to open AA meetings. They had cake. They've been to church. They've been baptized. They know about God. They know about recovery. All my friends, since they were small, have been sober members of AA. Wow. But they got their own road to walk. My daughter, the love of my life, the oldest of the two. She has three kids. I've been there for her since day one. Anything she wants, anything she wants, anything. Whatever you want, I give it to her. Not very healthy relationship, but that's just how it went. Almost six years ago, the children's services came and took the kids away. She got her face beaten off by her boyfriend. They kissed and made up, sort of. And she was just hitting the drugs real hard. And the children's services came, took her, the kids away. And then she went downhill real fast. Uh, moved in with her mom out three hours away from Toronto and got involved in the heavy drugs. Her mom couldn't stand it anymore, couldn't handle the people that were coming in and out of her life and in and out of the house. And she just couldn't stand it anymore. She took our daughter and drove her downtown to a shelter and left her there. And she's been there ever since. Breaks my heart. Tears me up every time I think about it. Last winter, I don't go often, but last winter we went down there only to discover all these great big six by eight by four foot boxes made of wood about six or seven inches off the ground on wheels. And people are living in these boxes outside in the snow. It gets cold up here, you all. It really does. It gets real cold. The snow gets deep. And she's living in a box. Um, Two years ago at Christmas time, my wife and I took her out for breakfast and I'm looking at her and I said, I'm, cry I'm in tears. I said, please come home. Steph, please come home. And she looked at me with fire in her eyes and turned to me and said, don't you ever, ever ask me that again. Asking me to come home with you is like telling you to quit going to AA. Now leave me the hell alone. Don't you even think about it. What, what she heard was, let me take away your answer. I have a better one for you. And I shut up. I've never mentioned it again. I've seen her a bunch of times since then. Um, it is the way it is. I have a message. What do I take away from that experience? I got, a, I got a message that there's hope for others with family, friends, people that are close to you. There's hope. I got through this. 
I was asked to make a list of what I want God to be and a, a, another list of what I don't want him to be. And I like showing off my list because I'm really proud of it because this God does exist. I want a relationship with God. I tell him about my, about my kid and I'm really hurt. I believe he is too. I want a relationship with God. God has been so eager to forgive me, merciful and gentle. He's available 24 hours a day. It, it dawned on me yesterday, I was doing my morning readings. I spend a, an hour every morning. I set my alarm an hour early so I could just sit there, be with God, do some readings and just be with God. So yesterday I got this, I'm very visual, so I get these images. Each and every one of us are on a bus. Happy road to destiny, right? Everything, and everywhere we go, everything is available to us. Everything. The banquet. AA, the 12 steps, is like a banquet. When you go to a banquet, the waitress doesn't say, you can have all of this, but you can't have that. No, no, you, we get it all. It's all available to each and every one of us. Everything. The bathroom's over there. The seats are over here. Everybody gets the front row. There's no one who sits in the back. We all got a front row seat everywhere we go. But some people don't want to ride on. Some of us are not capable of coming onto this bus with us. All it takes, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. <laughs> and a good tour guide, somebody who knows the way, right? Sponsor. Home group, somewhere to do stuff where you see the people every week, right? Wow, <laughs> what a gift. And then you got people like Carol asking, if you ask her to, to put you on the list, you'll get on the list, be doing what I'm doing here today. <laughs> you got, I think we're all like water carriers. We all carry water and we offer it to anybody. Come to the water and drink. It's free. Each and every one of us are brothers and sisters. And our last name is God. Thank you so much.